Um, everyone, uh, uh, welcome to my talk, um, EPM from RPL. And um, uh, my talk is about how to use data driven method to estimate uh, asymmetry from CESPA. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about my uh, four main parts. The first, I'm going to start with the motivation of. Um, estimating the symmetry from size span because we do have um, multi beam that can give the symmetry, like a really good symmetry. Why on earth do we want to use size scan to do that? And then another motivation would be why do we want to use data driven method to do that? Because, um, well, physical model could also give gives us some, something. And then I'm going to talk about the final goals of this. Uh, projects like the vision in the end what we want to achieve from such method and uh, then i'm going to dive into some details about two papers that how to do uh, assumption from size scan and in the end i will share a few thoughts about what i want to do in the future um, so the first question we want to answer is why size scan uh, well, the, the one reason to use size scan is that compared to multi beam, as you can see, uh, the coverage is much larger than, than multi beam. The multi beam can only see um, things directly down, and um, and, and size scan can um, usually have like three to four times of uh, coverage. And another reason is that um, has the uh, Sescan has a very high across track resolution, like in this direction. Um, usually you can get like centimeter level or sometimes millimeter level, which you, you cannot get uh, with the multi beam. Of course, along this along this track, the resolution of Sescan is not that good, but uh, of course we can survey the part so we, we can survey like the area with diagonal um, like trajectory so that we can have like high resolution like everywhere. And uh, of course, another reason would be size scan is really small and very cheap. Uh, for example, for SAM, um, it, like the, the whole point of SAM is to make a small and affordable uh, and water vehicles so that it's, it's reasonable to assume that we have a multi beam um, equipped so that if we can use that's going to estimate the symmetry, that would be really good. So another reason to answer is if we are doing to do this, why data driven method? So uh, at start, um, we want to say that estimate uh, the symmetry from size scan is you hold the problem. It's the same as if you want to estimate the depth in a camera image. Um, when you project, when you do the projection, you have the camera image, you lost the depth information. And um, same here, um, but, uh, but, but uh, of course, this different sensor is a different uh, formation of the image. And um, if we are to use a model-driven approach, that would require to know lots of information. For example, what's the, um, what's the sentiment characteristic? Is it sand or is it rocks or is it um, is a boat? Uh, it's a shipwreck uh, because they reflect differently. And also we, we, ha we have to model the scattering uh, properties, is, is it diffuse or, or not. And um, similarly, if we are, we are using shape from shading approach, we usually have to um, make some assumptions because we don't know a lot of information. So we, act we actually uh, simply find things, for example, um, we just assume there's like one type of seabed, it's all sand, and uh, that we, we can do. But uh, this is another one is like we, we just do it within one survey. Um, like if we are changing to another place, we, we have to do that all over again. But uh, with a uh, data driven method, with a neural network, we can actually uh, hopefully we can learn those properties just from looking at the sonar images. And um, of course, we can generalize well to some degree. I'm going to show you um, later that we can train on one type of terrain with salt water and then test it on another 
uh, different type of terrain in the lake and it, it generates pretty good. So the final goal or vision we, we want is <coughs> like this. So in the end, we, we, we are imagining that we have a few um, small UVs, like small stems, we can launch them and they have size scan, they have PVR and the MU. So they have reasonable navigation. Of course, they, they are gonna be drifts, but of course we can use a uh, modem to communicate with each other to, to limit those uh, navigation drifts. And then they survey an uh, area in parallel, which um, they, we, which they would have a lot of, um, so, so if, if they are going like this in parallel, and they will have a large amount of uh, overlaps like along this direction. And that's very important. Later, I, I'm gonna show that. And um, uh, after we collect the data, we can do some post-processing and then we can get a very high quality symmetry out of it. Maybe it's as good as the one we can get from the multi So um, the, the first thing, I did in this paper is that we just uh, use a neural network, a convolutional neural network to look at this size scan. Of course, it's done sample because usually you have size scan, like for every pin, you have sometimes like 6,000 pins. And um, it, it's really large for a neural network to take that as an input to train it, uh, uh, at least with like the current GPUs. And uh, we done sample this to like 256 or 512, this is like a reasonable size so that the neural network can train on it. And then this is the ground truth steps we get from the multi-beam. We can register them um, so that every pixel we actually know the ground truth. And then we train a bunch of neural networks with, with different architectures, ResNet, UNet, and then we use different modeling, discriminative model, as in autoencoders, and the generative model as in additional GANs. So we, we can see like they give us a bunch of estimates of this that contour. And then like this dark red area is no data because here we, we don't have data because it's in a water column. Um, we haven't hit the sea floor yet. And here, we don't have data because there's a huge rock or boulder, and then um, this is a shadow in size scan. So actually, we don't know like what's in the shadow or if there is like small rocks or what, what's going on there. So here we don't have data, and um, so the the result of this is that we can get reasonable results out of it, and um, if we look at the errors, it's somewhere around like. 25 centimeter error, like on average, of course. And um, one interesting thing is that the error actually drifts if you are further away from the sonar. So here is the sonar, and then we can see that like if you are really close to the size the error is pretty good, around like 10 centimeters and 20, or but if you are like further away, in all different models, the, the, the errors actually drift. But the reason, uh, there's a lot of reasons behind this. One is how we use, use the convolutional neural network because you know, convolutional neural network, we actually assume the resolution for every pixel remain the same, which in the sonar image is not, a, not that case because the, because if you are further away from the sonar, actually the resolution is, is like get smaller um, across track resolution. That's what I'm talking about. And then another reason is that the sonar's um, horizontal beam, even though it's a small angle, but if you are looking at it like a hundred meters away, that's 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 not going to that's that's going to result in a like pretty large distance. If, if, if you just think it's gonna within the same plane, then that's, um, that's a huge error there. So anyway, the, the take from this is that if we want to use this to, to reconstruct the symmetry, we need some extra constraints to just 
attractive um, drifting areas when you are far away from the sonar. So in the um, next paper, we what we are trying to do is we introduce these smart steps. They are coming from the altimeter readings along the sonar's trajectory. So if we got a pretty good navigation along the sonar's trajectory, and uh, we have uh, altimeter readings, they may come from DVL or they may come from, we just do some bottom tracking on the side scan images. We actually know the steps there. And those smart steps can give us additional constraints. Another thing is that we estimate uncertainty of our prediction, because sometimes we are more certain about the estimates. For example, if you are close to sonar and then if you are further away, you are not so certain about it. So we, we need to model that. And when we fill the map in the end, we can take those uncertainty into account. So the sparse steps, um, like I'm talking about, so this is like the sonar's trajectory all over the place. And um, we can see that along these trajectories, we actually know those steps so that we have a pretty general idea how the proximity is going to look like. Um, for example, here, the, the depth is a little different than here. So um, we, we have a general idea. And if we associate all those sparse depth points to the side scans uh, word for image, we can get a, we can get like this. So along these lines, we actually know the depth, but uh, it's that all of this in between, we don't know, and we have to infer those based on these constraints. And, um, and um, so the, the, the input of our neural network would be not only just the set scan image, but also the first steps. Um, this is an idea which is directly below the sonar. We, we know the depth there. And along these lines, they, they are coming from other sonar trajectories. And um, hopefully this would constrain our neural network to predict the depths like in between. In the end, when we get a dense uh, depth prediction, it would be uh, more accurate. Um, another thing we do is estimate the uncertainty. So uh, one way to do that is to use the negative log likelihood. Well, it, it, in a paper we can see, uh, not right now here, but uh, on slides um, it's called simple and scalable predictive uncertainty estimation used deep ensembles. They basically prove that this uh, Active log likelihood is a proper scoring rule, which means if you minimize that, you would get some uncertainty estimation. And um, if you um, try to um, train a bunch of different neural networks with, with the same settings, but with a slightly different initial, initialization, and uh, in the end, you just ensemble the result of it, you get a pretty decent uncertainty estimation. And the loss, of course, the uh, L would be like this if we model the predicted uh, depths as a Laplacian distribution. Of course, we can use Gaussian distribution, then we, we are going to use the L2 loss, but um, uh, we just found out this L1 loss works uh, slightly better. So here, our neural network would output two things for every piece. So one is the predict depths, which is actually the mean of this. Laplacian distribution. And another one is the variance. So if we calculate loss like this, we would have not only the predicted steps, but also uh, uncertainty associated as the um, as variance. Um, this would be our output and input of the neural network. So the neural network takes side scan and square steps as input and output is predict steps which is the mean and the uncertainty. So the uncertainty, like this red color indicates the uncertainty is high, so we are not certain about. And um, like the blue part means you have a lower uncertainty. We can see like this from these two images that if, if you have like a square steps here, here and here, we actually 
have a low uncertainty along these lines because you, you already know the stars that there. And then if you don't have these constraints for a while, you are getting more uncertainty about it. And we can actually look at the predict that compared to the ground truth that well, when they are when the neural network are not certain about here area, you actually have a larger area. So it shows that this uncertainty uh, estimation is doing a pretty good job. And um, another thing we invest is how the sparse depth quality um, affects our uh, our result. So here is what we are, we are doing. So if you look at this, uh, this is red dots. Three red dots are the sparse depths we provide. Assume that we provide the very accurate this sparse depths, and then the prediction this orange line is closely follow the ground truth with this blue line. But of course, if we corrupt this sparse depth, saying that you are actually over here, and then the estimates still they follow this the contour like going up and down and up again. But there is an offset because the sparse depth provided in your network is over here. But um, in, in the real case, um, if, if we are trying to get the altimeter reading from a real altimeter, altimeter, for example, DVL, this is usually the case because you wouldn't have the same um, sparse depth as you would here, which comes from the multi beam. So we have to think a way how to uh, model that as well. But it, it, here we show that these first steps really um, affect the prediction. And usually it's, it's, in the, it's in the form of this offset. And um, here is, we, we show that our neural network can generalize pretty well. So we, we trained on a totally different place now here is, is another place with different terrain and the salt water. And this is from Otala, the lake. And now uh, we have, of course, we have like lots of lines we can see from here. And um, like compared to the, the flimetry we get from the multi beam and the flimetry we get from Seska, we can see that um, the neural network is doing a pretty good job by fusing all those estimates we can get a really good map out of it, showing that the generalization ability of the new network is pretty good. But of course, here we are dealing with the same sonars, the same um, vehicles to collect the data, but only the difference is that it's in a, another place. And uh, this is the confidence map. We fuse all those uncertainty estimations. Again, uh, this red means we are very confident. So we can see that along this sonar's trajectories, because we are providing the sparse depth, so it's very confident about those. And uh, in, in the areas which we don't have much constraints there, we are slightly getting more uncertain about the prediction. Um, the prediction. And um, we also show that um, we, we can see that um, we, we are all over the place with like a lot of overlapping. And uh, of course we have a lot of like sparse depths on top of it. And we just want to show how many sparse depths we actually need to produce a pretty good result. We actually show that if you only produce like 30% of the sparse depths, we can still get a pretty good result with like 10 centimeter errors. But of course these 30% lines, we are not like true, true Choose them randomly, but so we carefully design the missions. Basically, they they are evenly distributed. They are all over the place, and they are uh, diagonal, so that we can see the same place from orthogonal directions. But still, we will show that we can improve the survey efficiency by a lot if we use Seska. And also, if we don't have sparse depths at all, the errors would be really large. It's like, um, it's more than like 50 centimeters. Um, another thing we showed that is the uncertainty estimation works. So again, here is the map we got from the symmetry. Uh, 
of the signature regard from the multi beam. And that here is we use uh, no uncertainty estimation. We just assume that we don't have uncertainty. We just treat all of those estimates like equally. And then we can see these artifacts because in this case, we are not very certain about the estimate, but uh, we just don't know it. We just don't use it. But if we use those uncertainty estimations, say uh, if you are not certain about those, we just weight it a little less and we feel the data. We can see that if we use the uncertainty estimation, we can get a much better map than this. But of course, it's not the same as there, but still um, we are getting better. It just shows that uh, this uncertainty really can help us, especially on places like, like the big hills that we are not certain about. And um, here is another approach where we start to think um, instead of we use, like before, we use a mesh or grid to represent the symmetry, we actually use a neural network to represent the, the symmetry. So this is the, for, for another paper and I'm about to submit. The reason to do that, uh, why do we want a neural network to represent the symmetry? Um, so the, the thing with this kind of neural network is actually it's a mapping function from the X and Y coordinates to the Z coordinates. So the neural network is this is this parameterized uh, by this by these neurons, and then it's uh, mapping from the x y coordinates to, to the depth. And uh, the cool thing about this, first of all, uh, is continuous. Um, if you have mesh or grids, they are not uh, because they are not continuous. So actually, if you have a larger area, you, you actually use, you have to use more memory usage if you want to keep the same resolution. For example, if you have a mesh of a place with 100 meters times 100 meters, and then you want to keep the same resolution and you want to search a much larger area, then you need more memory to store it that. But um, if you are having a continuous representation of the symmetry, you don't need that because it's continuous. You can just sample it. It doesn't matter if the area is really huge or really small, but uh, what matters is the complexity of the thing. If it's like, like just flat sea floor, there's nothing going wrong. You can represent the symmetry with a really small neural network. But if it's like a very complex scene, for example, this room, you have the chairs, you have the computers, you have the, uh, the walls, all of that, then you need a much uh, larger neural network. So that's like one advantage. Another advantage of using this neural network to represent the symmetry is that it's differentiable. So it's actually a multi-layer perception with sine activation functions. So it's, we call it siren because it's a sinusoidal implicit representation of the neural network. Um, the good thing with sine activation function is that if you take der derivative of sine, it's just another sine function, but with phase shifted. So it allows us to get a really high quality gradient. And by doing that, we can directly supervise on those gradients. And then later we can show that by doing that, we can get a high quality proximity map with like small details, like rocks and um, boulders showing up. So um, the first thing to do, we are trying to uh, estimate not the depth, but the surface normal from the size scan. Uh, so basically we are looking at like uh, size scan like this, and uh, we are estimating the surface normal projected to the size scan plane. This is the ground truth, this is the prediction. They are doing a pretty good job. So basically it's the same neural, convolution and neural network like before, but with slightly changes. The only change is that we need to deal with this long tail distribution. So as we all know, like underwater, the seabed usually is pretty flat. So the surface normal are really a small angle. It's like near zero. Sometimes you can get like 10 degrees sloping, but it, that, that's pretty much it. But of course, when you have a big rock or, or a big hill, you have surface normals that are really large, but at those time, like those samples are very small in the distribution. So when we learn it, 
use the neural network, we have to figure out, figure out a way to address those. Otherwise, the neural network would be, would be producing some results like it's, it's flat everywhere and then get a pretty decent error. So what we are doing, basically, the idea is very simple, um, is that if the surface normal the value, the absolute value are large, we put a large weight on it. And if it's near zero, we put a smaller weight on it so that when the neural network learns this, it can concentrate on this place because this is the interesting place we care about the result of the rocks. And um, so here is the, that part. We train a convolution neural network to look at the size scan and learn the, the normals. And uh, here, like this part is again, no data because there is like a heel there and uh, this uh, shadow. We don't have the, we don't have the ground truth data as well. So we train it on, we, we split our data set in training set and test set. So we train it with the convolution neural network on the training set and on the test set is that, is that we are going to reconstruct our work of symmetry. Right, sorry. Um, so the, the, the idea is quite simple that we have a side neural network can produce the symmetry. And then with that, we can produce the gradient and then um, we take the gradient we got from the convolution neural network and then we concentrate on that, on the loss, on the surface normal. And also we have the sparse steps we talk about, we can concentrate on that. These two loss would help this siren, which is our work of symmetry to learn. And in the end, we, we would get a pretty good result out of it. So this is the result. Um, I, I can show you another one. So this is the ground truth we got from the mouse beam, and this is the, the, uh, the, the gradient of the symmetry, which we can show these small rocks. And here is we use like 12 lines of size scan with the sparse labs, 12 lines, and also we use those size scan to um, constrain on the surface normal. We can get a pretty good result. Um, well, it's, it, it's not perfect because we have this artifacts when we don't have uh, enough overlapping or enough right angles to see. But still we capture the larger area and then we can see some of the small routes here. And uh, we also did the experiment to, com to compare if I use a physical model <laughs> instead of a convolution neural network to estimate the, the normals. Um, here is a zoom in part with uh, interesting place, like lots of rocks there. And then we can show that um, we, we, we still get a few big rocks like here and here, um, but uh, we are, and here, but we are losing a lot of them because our neural network cannot predict like the purpose of normal from the size scan. Um, yeah, this is uh, just now is another place. And um, the future work would be replace all this part to be a differentiable rendering process because now we need the multi beam for symmetry to train our neural network, which is a pain. But uh, in the future, if we can somehow make this rendering process differentiable so that we don't need this uh, 3D information we got from the multi beam to train the neural network, then that would be very interesting. And uh, another part would be estimate the symmetry together with the sonar holes, because now we assume we have like perfect navigation, but in the real case, we already have some drift. And that's another thing we want to do. And um, of course we want to do something on more um, sonar data from different vehicles. So to see if the neural network can generate well. Uh, basically that's, um, that's it, thanks.